as I was analyzing the data forensically, the, all the documents in a project, there was always one moment when it started going south and if they'd have stopped right then and caught it and fessed up to it and talked about it, they wouldn't have had that, that disaster of a project. Mm. All of the stuff that rippled out from that would have, and usually it was in a daily report. It wasn't in the <laughs> minutes of the meetings and all that. It was in a superintendent's daily report or a trade contractor's daily wow. report. That thing was there and, and you could, you could, trace what the you know what, what happened after that and, and just how it compounded okay here's one yeah. um in the early or in the mid 90s when i was a, a project manager my title for this particular company was director of project management for the western us and latin america very impressive title <laughs> i chose it myself as a condition of employment <laughs> well done dan <laughs> on the east coast was another guy whose title was not director. He, we were going to be peers, but he was not director. So uh, they said, well, we can't make you a director because uh, Tom, we'll call him. It's not, that's not his name. Yeah. Uh, Tom is uh, a manager and he's not a director. I said, well, promote him because in order to do what you want me to do here, I got to be at the director level. So I said, okay, Tom got a big promotion out of it. Yeah. And Tom was an interesting guy. I finally figured out why Tom was so popular in the company. Tom was a consummate firefighter. He could fly in on the next plane to somewhere and solve a problem. And everyone would go, Tom is amazing. Look, he did it again. <laughs> what I finally figured out after a couple of years of watching yeah. is that he would hire people who were not really up to the task. So he would let them fail so he could fly in and save them. Now wow. that, that is a firefighter. It's good to so be here. So good to see you. I so good to see you, Dan. Enjoy being with you, Felipe. Yeah, let's get so excited that we just talk over each other the whole time. Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the EBFC Show, the easier, better for construction podcast. I'm your host, Felipe Engineer Manriquez. This show is all about the business of construction. Today's episode is sponsored by Bosch Refine My Site is a cloud-based construction collaboration platform that applies lean principles to enable your entire team to plan, communicate, and execute in real time. It's the digital tool that works in tandem with your last planner system process and puts it all together in one simple collaborative ecosystem. This easy to use platform is available in English, German, Spanish, Portuguese, and French, and can be used on desktops, tablets, and mobile devices. According to Spencer Easton, scheduling manager at Oakland Construction, Refine My Site, in my opinion, is the best, leanest tool on the market for the last time. Here's what our users have to say. We've looked at three other digital scheduling platforms and none compare to the straightforward approach Refund My Site takes. From milestone planning all the way down to daily tasks, this program gives every general contractor and their trade partners meaningful collaboration, accountability, and KPIs. Register today to try Refine My Site for free for 60 days. Today's episode is sponsored by Construction Accelerator. The design and construction industries come up with and build great things, but we also build in waste in how we do those things, in our interactions, in our contracts, in our logistics. So what does this do for our bottom line or our next project? The best firms maximize their value by removing that waste and only doing what's essential to the work, what makes them money. Construction Accelerator will train you to see the waste and give your teams the lean tools and experience to remove it immediately. All online, Construction Accelerator is made up of three to nine minute videos that can be watched again and again in the field, at the office, and at home, all broken down by topic. Need to learn pool planning? We have videos on the process, how to set up a room, and how to kick off a team. Need to set up a target value delivery project? We discuss all the aspects of TVD, especially cost. Or maybe you just need to brush up on 5S. Well, we have videos on that as well. You can download and print reference materials to use on site to immediately translate watching into doing. Subscribe today at trycanow.com. Let's build an industry, not just a project. 
Today's show is also sponsored by the Lean Construction Institute. LCI is working to lead the building industry in transforming its practices and culture. Its vision is to create a healthy and thriving industry that delivers outstanding project outcomes every time for everyone. Check the show notes for more information. Now, to the show. Dan, as yes. promised, I've got your book right oh, here. Bless your heart. Author Five Dan bucks, Fauché. Ching. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Money in my pocket. Dan, I was looking at this book again, and I, and I was thinking some of the things that uh, I've gone to other resources to put my head back in, it's right there in the appendix. <laughs> like It's just right there. Very well done. Thank you. Very well done. How many years has it been since this book came out, Dan? A couple. I think I think it I think twenty nineteen, I think it was. Was wow, was it just twenty nineteen? It's like it was I just think. yesterday. I, I could be off a year. I don't know. <laughs> it's like, I could look COVID in threw there. me off. <laughs> yeah. Everything else the... one. It's pre COVID or post COVID. It's just two thousand seventeen, Dan. Oh, there we go. Well that's the copyright. I looked on the back of the cover, according to you, off co author of the book with Dave Onstott. You didn't start your lean journey until 2009. I started uh, being a lean coach in 2009, but I was uh, in 2008 is when I met Greg Howell, uh, changed my life, uh, worked with Glenn Ballard and Iris Tomalin and and Kristen uh, Hill and and just like you know Dean Reed. And, I mean, my goodness, uh, <laughs> you know, all the all the all the people that we know that know this, Victor Senvito. Uh, they were yeah. all all part of that uh, that one project, that giant project in Sacramento. It was pretty cool. Greg Howell, I was just talking to somebody from LCA just this week, and you know we were saying Greg and Glenn just sparked off so much change across the industry that oh. we're still feeling the effects right now. From Greg Howell, I learned everything. <laughs> 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 I, I mean, he 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 was he was. He is genuinely my my original mentor. Uh, I mean, all the other people I mentioned are are included in that. But uh, it, it was a personal relationship with Greg, uh, as it was with everyone um, that, that knew him. Uh, humility. I learned humility from Greg uh, in the in the face of not knowing everything. You know, <laughs> uh, I learned one of the things I learned from Greg was the the power of the ever curious mind. He was curious about everything. He had an easiness with learning that that uh, transmitted to the people around him, an approach to learning together with other people. Uh, and the thing that I that I really love about Greg Howe, uh, and I'm still working on this one, is that somehow he had a way of making you feel like you had a special relationship with him. And that's a unique skill. Uh, and, and it was genuine. I mean, it, everyone did. <laughs> right. And uh, how big does your heart have to be to be able to do that? It's got to be gigantic. He was a force on you, Dan, because you later became a force on me. And yeah. and so many of the friends that I have uh, mentioned Greg Howell, too, as a powerful mentor. Yeah. And as well as Glenn as well. Yes. To, to many others. Yeah, the two Glenn's of them. still cranking it out. Yes, still, he is. Still going, man. Yeah, he's very much uh, working in the public sector, trying to transform yes. government. And uh, I think he's caught on that companies do follow what governments say to some degree, and that yeah. you can get a little more change that way. Yep. I mean, it. It, it there's all these pieces that have got to fall into place to really launch forward like this. But yes, agreed. We've got uh, you know people waking up every day, every day, Dan, with just complete amnesia. And they yeah. don't have the experiences that we had. Yeah. And it's just not the same world every day with, with yeah. all the people joining the industry. So yeah. it's kind of good to to take a step back like we do on the show and have a long conversation about some of yeah. the things that, that we just take for granted we've been after for so many years and for some of us over a decade. Yeah. So with and, that, Dan, go, go ahead. ahead. No. No, you go. You go. You uh, go, Dan. I was going to say that you have you have an ability to, uh, to pull – uh, ideas out of people's minds that were just kind of sitting there, but not really expressed. I've watched in the in all the different podcasts of yours that I've watched. Uh, they're clearly unscripted. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> but I but I've watched you just just pull and listen, and and it's a good talent. I I respect it. 
as yeah, a facilitator, you, I respect it. Tell the audience, who is Dan Fauché? Oh, my goodness. We've, we've been working on that for decades. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've been in construction for, I, I, I'm going to fess up, 45 years uh, hmm. in design and construction. That includes a, a few years in development uh, when I was hiring architects and, and engineers and contractors. Uh, but uh, uh, all of that together, 45 years. Uh, I, I, I was a project manager for the most, most of the first part of that. Um, and uh, a darn good one. I was, you know, I was very efficient at managing waste. I had great record keeping. <laughs> I could, you know, I could tell you who screwed up where and when and, and all that. Um, yeah. I, I was even a claims consultant once upon a time. I don't tell people that very often. Oh, no wonder you have such special skills with recognizing that, things. That's the negative side. Um, but uh, I got into partnering, uh, but, you know, and, and a lot of the lean community doesn't understand or appreciate partnering uh, because they think it's touchy feely and it's really not. Uh, can, it can be, uh, you know, and it's a cottage industry for some of that. But uh, Dick Byer and I uh, are working with a guy named Tom Brasher, Tom and Marsha Brasher up in the state of Washington, uh, developed alignment partnering, which is a very different kind of thing. Um, and it's, it's very lean as it turns out. Uh, so our first lean job, this one in Sacramento, uh, with, with all the saints of lean, uh, we were hired to be the partnering facilitators on that project. And we told them, you, you don't really want just partnering. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's how we, we, we made it in the interview is we said, they, you think you just want partnering. You don't want just partnering. You want yeah. facilitated interaction collaboration you know we started describing that it, yeah that's what we want that's what we want yeah. so that that's that started the lean journey yeah that's a, a good heritage yeah there, there have been some books written dan where they describe lean people with a capital l yeah. and i would put you at one of those capital l big l <laughs> people for sure <laughs> i mean you, you, you've, re you've written a book about it and it's uh, good it's a good book people I, rec I highly recommend you get it. I actually had, at one time, Dan, I had three copies of this book. Wow. I had yeah, the one that I bought. Yeah. I still have the one on Kindle. Yeah. And then I won a copy at the oh, design forum. Sweet. It might have been a quote, uh, like, uh, who said this quote? And I think it was a Deming quote. And I got that oh, right. So. Yeah. Well, you're going to get that huge, one. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of Deming. <laughs> <laughs> As I think you are, too. Yeah, I am, very much, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, very cool. CA, baby. PDC Deming and Duran both. Duran doesn't get he doesn't get the notoriety I, I know. think that Deming gets for some yeah, it's reason. Kind of the, it's kind of the little brother of the whole thing. I don't know why. <laughs> but there's yeah. a there's a Duran Institute or something like Duran. Yeah, there is. Uh yeah. that that really is the kind of the keeper of a lot of the wisdom of the two of them. Uh and Walter Schubert and the, you know, all that whole gang. Uh, I worked for a company in the mid nineties that this is before all the things we had just been talking about. But I, as a project manager, I worked for a company that had big dimming posters up everywhere, but they didn't follow a one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Which is ironic because Deming said, throw away your posters and slogans. Yes. yes. <laughs> so and that's all they had. That's all they had of the whole thing. Somebody had come through a few years before and yeah. sold them these posters and they thought it was, you know, yeah. Yeah. posters and, and visual workplace, not the same. Not the same thing. Not even close. Nope. And uh, people listening, we absolutely want to take a pause for a second and just thank the listeners, the viewers, the watchers. Get yep. your hands dirty, people, as I would like to say. I'm glad that you were a, a project manager. I, I, too, was a recovering project manager. From your perspective, Dan, and you're yep. working with like the you know big players in the industry, do you think COVID killed or dampered or hindered Lean implementation across the United States. Oh or man, the that's the word. That's that's the phrase. I actually put that phrase out there. I, I'm I'm going to accuse you of stealing it from me. I uh, just stole but it. it. But it's an idea that whose time has come. Uh, we did we did a couple of uh, webinars and and some other stuff on did COVID kill lean? Uh, because I started you know talking to clients and and colleagues and and they, they were suffering from it. Yeah. Uh, and so actually through LCI. Uh, we convened uh, what we now call the Gang of 16. And we went out to, to 30 people and said, would you, would you help us understand 
what we need, the, you know, the impact of COVID on the industry, on, on your program, would you just collaborate with us? And 16 said yes. And they're 16 of the most wonderful people I've ever met. Uh, and, uh, and so, it, you know, uh, and so we came out with a, an understanding of, and what we found, what they told us, they told each other, was that for about half the people, maybe not quite half, COVID had a serious negative impact. One classic example, a trade contractor, uh, the executive said, we've got to pull in our horns. We've got to cut expenses. So you decide how you want to do that. And they decided that they would keep all the people on the, on the payroll and they would cut travel and training and literally everything else, coffee, uh, whatever wow. they had to cut, they would cut yeah. to keep the people, which is respect for people, right? That's Absolutely. a very lean approach. Uh, but it meant that there was a damage to the program. Uh, so a number of people suffered those kinds of things. Um, but the other half of the people, lean was the answer that they had needed anyway. And they were wow. already on an, an acceleration path. And lean was perfect for COVID because it helped them reduce additional waste and quickly turn on a dime with the supply chain issues and all that stuff. Uh, so, it, I mean, it was really a remarkable kind of experience and two different sides of the same world. You mentioned some trade partners. I'm sure there's some a mix of general contractors. What have you heard from the design community on that part? Where did they fall on one side or the other? They Very much the same thing. First of all, designers uh, as, as a group tend to struggle a little bit with how to implement lean. Not all of them. I mean, there are guys like like Boulder Associates and you know our, our, our friends there that, that, uh, that really got it figured out and, and they, they know how it works. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, Romano, Nickerson and people like that. But uh, the interesting thing is that this gang of 16, after a couple of meetings, we came up with um, a list of five major things and with some definition of each that we, that we would recommend that, that organizations do to pull lean more deeply into the organization. Of the 16 people, uh, about uh, uh, three of them were architects and engineers, three of them were, were uh, trade contractors, three of them were owners, and the rest were GCs. So it's, you know, nine and six, kind of like twice yeah. as many GCs as any one of those groups. But that's kind of the makeup of LCI too. After we developed that with everyone's input, the designers said, let us take this and reword it a little bit so that it makes more sense to the architectural and design community. Uh, because there's some words in here that don't work for us. Uh, and if we don't want this to be relevant, we need to do this. So yes, it, uh, it, it is an impact for designers. It is a different language. And we have done a moderately good way of, of translating construction centric. And where could people get access to this said list? Uh, it's a secret right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're waiting for the designers to come back with the design version of that. Uh, I've got a copy I'll share with you. Uh, all the, right. the, the gang of 16 all have it. Uh, and it's something that the, the plan is to uh, offer it up to LCI. Uh, maybe it debuts at Congress. Um, uh, if, uh, if our if you get proposal selected. is accepted. <laughs> yeah. I got to tell you, I'm on the abstract selection team, Dan, and it did oh, not cool. come into my mix. Oh. So I didn't, I didn't see it, but I only, each of the volunteers just gets okay. a slice and we can't uh, do our own yeah. stuff. I mean, something like that is just uh, perfectly ties into facilitation. So you kind of removed yourself and just created a venue an environment where the gang of 16 could come together. Yeah. What's that like, Dan, when you're working facilitation? It's exhilarating. Um, it's, it can be very challenging. I mean, that was a, a super positive kind of group and, and they were, they were mostly lean champions and the people that, you know, that really, uh, really do this stuff on a daily basis. So, uh, it was a little easier for that group to, to get together and, and talk through it. Uh, if anything, the, the, the facilitation skill there is to stay out of the way, uh, right. and just to kind of guide it so that no one dominates and everybody gets it chance to weigh in. Uh, other, other project facilitation uh, is very often um, a tensor, uh, more tense. I don't know. I'm an English major. Yeah. Let's okay. just make that word up, tensor. Okay, tensor. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, the, the, there, are, there are times when, you know, that people get in their silos and, and somebody said something that hurt their feelings and they went down to the personal 
level on something and so there's conflict or or the thing yeah. is really stressed uh there's a team out there that that's just like the budget i mean these days the budgets are horrendously tight um and schedule has always been tight or at least for a long long time but budgets have gotten unreal uh there was one team that that day one they launched the the budget that had been proposed in the rfq the rfp was cut by 25 percent day one that's how they started their their, their project using that's a that's advanced owner graduate studies right there that's, <laughs> cut, cut the job by 20 well, percent and advanced know, is 25 percent yeah right if cutting it by 20 is good an extra five percent is great an extra five let's just cut the half of it um <laughs> but i mean they did it they they, they used target value delivery uh oh, and we used good. the lean alignment partnering uh, and they they pulled it off, and it's about to come to fruition. If people are wondering, because a lot of people really don't know what target value delivery is, mm. I highly recommend uh, you go to Dan's website. The quick URL is try ca now ca for construction accelerator, trycanow.com. Uh, yeah, there's you know Stanchu, you and I know and love Stanchu. Yep. Stanchu did uh, three amazing five minute videos on set-based design. And he took uh, an hour and a half of material that he gives at Lean Design Forum. And, and he worked with Kyle Martinez, uh, my, my colleague, and, and condensed it down into three five-minute videos, very high graphics. Uh, Stan is not, his face doesn't appear, his cartoon face does, uh, <laughs> but which is, is a cool cartoon. Um, yeah. But his, uh, you know, it's, it's his voice though, he's rich buttery right. voice uh, and these ideas that are just so clearly explained. Uh, it, you're right. It's, it's a great series. And then the whole target value delivery thing that is the, the integrated component with set-based design is all there, all there. Cluster group stuff, all that. I just was polling a, a group of pre-construction people recently somewhere in the country. We'll let it be anonymous. And I asked them, who can give me the definition for set-based design? And in a room of 10 people, zero wow and, it, and it's 2021 wow and then also i asked uh who knows what's the difference between target value delivery target value design and i've asked that of a mix of architects owners general contractor trade people and there you start to get like 20 percent or yeah. less yeah 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 that know well, they, that. they so may I, have been around at the time that the lci did the conversion from target value design to target value delivery so if, if they were around at that time they may have gotten the gotten the noise of it that's why i say both just because some architects yeah. just refuse to acknowledge yeah. that that someday we actually build something and it should be yeah. called delivery <laughs> oh no, they don't architects don't acknowledge they they know that this is for building come on no because i've had quite a few i mean i could almost point you back to a couple of guests on my show some architects really? and and the word they refuse to say delivery delivery only huh. target value design even designs get delivered, so I don't know what the <laughs> objection would be. I, I don't know either. I love that. So the resources there are really good. I watch it. I learn from that site. Cool. It's, uh, it's very a la LinkedIn learning. For those old enough to remember, like lynda.com style, Kyle Martinez does a great job of putting those, Isn't curating it? the videos together. So yeah. And the and I, I'm not trying to make it like sales commercially, like, but you, no, get, no, no. Yeah. you get video, you get the audio experience of listening, and then each one of the modules has handouts too, because some people like yeah. to learn by reading as well. Yeah. So Tightly coupling learning with action, you know, very lean. There are action items to put what you learn in the video into action. Uh, little tests, some of the reasons cartoon video quizzes in some cases. Yeah. Andy Fulton did a great job on, on a whole bunch of the videos. And Kyle and Andy really worked together on that. Uh, you know, Rene Bustamante was the one who really designed the program. Somebody called it the other day, somebody called it the, the Reese's Pieces of Lean. Uh, and I, I'm like, yes, wow. I love that. <laughs> But not so sweet that you'll get a cavity. A lot of the people that don't like lean or have had a bad taste in their mouth with with trying lean in the past, and, and often, Dan, you, members of, like yourself and your team go into projects to help with like showing people how to do lean. And, yeah. and this whole idea, I think there's this like theoretical part that's completely disconnected from the Gemba where the yeah. work occurs. Yeah. What can you tell me about a story about going to the Gemba? It's been eye-opening, oh, like, connecting that action that you talk about in your videos back to doing something well i mean I, I i don't know if this answers the question but i'll i'll pull a politician i'll tell you if it doesn't i'll 
I'll answer the question I want you to ask me. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> That's called a redirect, ladies and gentlemen. That, that Classic facilitator that? move. So this is 2011. John Wayne Airport. Yeah. It was uh, it's Terminal C, which is the Southwest Terminal. And Southwest was expanding and they needed all these gates. Late May of 2011, it had to open for the, uh, for the holiday season, for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Because that's when airlines, you know, P6 said they had five months worth of work left to do. And they had three months left to do it in. Because they had to finish, their drop dead date was September 9th of 2011. P6 was telling them that they, they simply couldn't make it in. So uh, they decided, let's, you know, let's, let's try last planner. I mean, we're, we're behind the eight ball here. Which is very often how companies come to last planner or right. lean or anything else that's good is they, you know, they need. They, that's how I got trouble. involved with lean. Same yeah. way. They get yeah. in trouble. Uh, you know, pain is a prod to understanding. Yogananda says. <laughs> um, so a parachuted in behind enemy, enemy lines. The first day was so fun because the superintendent said, good luck with this because these, these trade foremen are really kind of annoyed at each other. I mean, in fact, they're not even kind of, uh, they're at each other's throats. Uh, I don't know if that was the phrase he used, but it, that's, that was the meaning. Uh, the, there are very few areas to work in. We haven't been able to condition the interior spaces yet. So there's all kinds of work that's got to be done and we can't get there. And so they're fighting over spaces and they keep coming to, to the job site earlier and earlier each day to get ahead of each uh, at the other, to get in, to grab a space. But you know, last planner, all you have to do is explain and get people facing a wall and give them some, their own color of sticky and say, let's, let's figure this out. And you start at the end and you start pulling backwards. And there were no harsh words. There were no arguments. They collaborated and they were doing things like, well, look, why, why don't you go in first and get that? And then I can come in behind you and I'll have more, more work, room, room to work. And conversations that had never been uttered on that job <laughs> site before. It's, it's transformational. But uh, right. you don't, you know, you can be in all the last planner classes you want and read all the books, even the really good ones um, <laughs> that, you, that you want. Um, and uh, thank you very much uh, that, uh, that you want. But it's not the same as going to the Gemba. The Gemba teaches you everything. Uh, everything. And, and that was an example of, you know, you could, you could read about it. You could look at the, at the CPM schedule and all, but none of that matters. Talk to the people, go to the place make it work and that's all the gimba means it's just a japanese yeah. word meaning where the value is created i talked about this with joe damaruno who wrote the lean builder and he said yes. i love joe. when you take yeah, i love joe too he's like when you take these these tasks or these pieces of work that people have like it's their work all of the energy all the charge when you put it on the board and they can go look at let's all stand and look at the board yeah. now the problems are on the board and they're no longer it's no longer the problems here on me. Instead of facing each other and, yeah. and looking at each other as the problem, you're facing the wall and you're looking at the, the need. You know, what, what is the issue here? How can we work? How can we figure this out? You know, I had a, one of the uh, earlier experiences with coaching last planner. Uh, it was a Swinerton job at a hospital, uh, an active hospital, a sharp hospital. And uh, after a few weeks of working together, uh, the superintendent said, you know what I like about this more than anything? And I thought he was going to tell me that, you know, our, our PPC is up or, you know, yeah. so he said, no, uh, now when I wake up at two o'clock in the morning and I can't sleep because of a problem that I'm trying to solve, I know that there are two or three other foremen waking up at two o'clock in the morning <laughs> and trying to help me solve this problem. We are genuinely a team on this. And that's the best thing about this. And I went, wow, that's pretty cool. First of all, that is very cool. Let's, let's try to avoid, pro let's remove constraints and try to avoid those problems yeah. that keep you up. That superintendent realizing that there are foremen that he's hired yeah. or his company's hired, yeah. holding themselves accountable. I want to hear your thoughts about accountability, Dan, because I know that you often go in and people are like, it's the blame game. Yeah, you you kind of uncover some different things that they might not be aware of. Accountability. I mean, the the classic accountability metric is PPC. People, some people call percent plan complete. I call percent of promises complete, because a plan is just like some amorphous thing. A promise that's personal, and yeah. and I think that accountability ought to be as personal as, as possible. But when it comes to keeping PPC, you want to keep it as a team, and not. Yeah. Count the individual, at least not 
talk about the individual company or, or foreman's PPC because that's when that kind of us them thing starts breaking out. And I've seen it. I've, I've been on job sites where that was the problem. They couldn't get people to come to the, to the weekly work planning uh, because they didn't want to be called out as you know the, the bad guy. Uh, and that's because they were doing exactly that. It doesn't work. Uh, but accountability uh, really requires absolute clarity. I can't be accountable for something that I'm not clear on, that, I, that I'm supposed to be doing, or that I right. know how to do, or whatever. In constraint removal, uh, our, our mutual friend, Colin Milberg of ASKM Associates in, in Boston, Colin is really good at this. Uh, and, and he taught me, and not very long ago, um, that, uh, and it's a, it's a course that he does for, uh, for AGC, that, that make work ready and the constraint identification uh, really requires visualization. That it, and, I, and I hadn't thought about that, and it's, he's right that if you really want to know if there are no constraints leading up to the beginning of that activity or in the middle or wherever, that you have to literally step yourself through each one of those things. And there's a checklist and all that, but you have to mentally go there uh, just like it's virtual reality or something. And here's what I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do this. And so he does, uh, and I helped him do it. He does visualization exercises with superintendents and foremen and people. Uh, to, you know, first kind of on a simple thing like making coffee, but then yeah. ultimately on, on the project itself and visualizing clearly, stepping through all the things you're going to do. So the accountability requires that kind of clarity in order for us to really then to be held accountable. And I want to just reiterate to every single general contractor listening now, Every single trade partner, every architect, every designer, everybody without exception, every consultant selling last yes. planner facilitation services, every single coach, hobbyist, amateur, or professional, do not count individual PPC yes. unless you want your project to crash and burn on purpose. Yeah. Yeah. And, oh, I forgot, the owner community. Every yeah. single owner, do Let not incentivize individual PPC unless you want a war to break out on your site. Yeah. Now, there, there's one exception. If the, uh, I, I was on a project, a fairly large project, uh, and I'll tell you about it in a minute, but in this, in this because I want to, it's so cool. Um, <laughs> the, in this particular, this team wanted to keep PPC by individual, by company, you know, by team. Um, and it was a, a huge project, 27 housing units and three hospital buildings and a big kitchen, all kinds of stuff. It's a prison hospital in Stockton. And they wanted to keep it individually. I said, OK, I know you're going to do it anyway, so I can't tell you don't do it because you have the data. But don't tell anybody about it. <laughs> you can know in your own yeah. head, you know, yeah. that, the, that the, the plumber ain't, you know, pulling his weight or the, whatever. But I'm sorry, plumbers, I just. Picked you out yeah. random. Um, we could say electrician. But, but it could be anybody. Uh, yeah. it, but but don't front them off in front of the group and don't embarrass them and don't like hold them. You know. So uh, so they, they that's what they did and it, it was okay because it told them where they could could go to give additional help. Uh, it, it guided management in that in that sense. But uh, so this project, can I tell you about it? Yeah, please. All right. So it's it, the whole thing was a billion dollars. This is the thing that was built. This billion dollar project was what was built out of what was supposed to be seven billion dollars of projects in that Sacramento thing we were talking about. So, um, you know, that came to fruition in 2009 and the state was broke. But they had a million, uh, I'm sorry, a billion dollars stashed away somewhere to put this into. And so they were able to fund it. So it was done as a design build, and it was one of the, it probably was the biggest design build that the legislature had ever okayed and funded. They, so it started off as 24 month, and uh, about six months into it, uh, when they finally got the funding, they said the legislature's given us funding, but now we're six months late, uh, so you only have 18 months to put the 473 million in place. Uh, so they, Somebody, and I know who, said, sure, okay, we can do that. Uh, and off they went. Uh, and 
So now fast forward. I mean, yeah. they, they were bringing, they had one 25% of all the block masons in California were parking their pickups in their pickup lot, in their, in their lot every day for a period of months when this thing was going on. It was a huge project. Um, so now fast forward, it's, it's 18 weeks before punch list. They are ramped up to doing $1.5 million a day work in place. Wow. 1.5 million a day work in place. And they realized they would have to double it to make the, the, the schedule. They would have to double it in six weeks in order to hit that 18 week punch list milestone. Again, brought in last planner because <laughs> our P6 ain't getting us there. Pull, and pull our, the on down core. We're not going to make there it. There you go. And our, our SIP schedule ain't getting us there. Yep. Uh, so we introduced it. And I'm not going to go on with it. In six weeks, they were hitting $3 million a day work in place. And bottom line, they finished five weeks early, $3 million a day work in place. It's Double doable. the production. Yeah, it's totally it. doable. Yeah. And uh, for people that don't know what SIPS is, it's a version of tact scheduling. Yeah, it, it kind of, yeah. It's, it's a, it, this one was in Excel, and it's a waterfall yeah. Uh, schedule with people moving from building to build trades moving across different areas a short interval production schedule is what the acronym means yeah there's one gc that uses it exclusively that i won't name their name right now it's the one gc dan hasn't mentioned yet oh okay <laughs> and they're also we're not part of the gang of 16 oh interesting <laughs> yeah all right i'll tell you i'll tell you after the show dan who it is. Yeah. <laughs> so that's awesome there's actually a, if you want to know what contractor i'm talking about it's in this book here by my friend oh. Jason Schroeder and uh, calls out the SIPs, you know, who's famously known for doing SIPs. Look at that. Look at that plug to this Jason book? Schroeder. Yeah, this yeah. book right here. Jason's amazing. Yeah, he is. You know, speaking of books, Dan, what a perfect transition. It's almost like there was some planning put to this. I know there were planning and, and I know there wasn't. <laughs> how, how do people that don't know and have these experiences, what's a way for them to gain knowledge, Dan, in a team environment? One of the Best ways I've seen uh, is the study action team. Hmm. What's um, that, Dan? Well, let me let me tell you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> SAT study action team. Um, it, it, it's usually a group of six or eight people. You maybe have ten, uh, but you want to keep a small teams so that people. You know, six to nine. It's the the scrum numbers. Six to nine is the is the right, right number of people. Right. Oh well, well done, Dan. Oh, Dan Fouché, ladies and gentlemen, recently. Uh, trained as a scrum master by your scrum master. Certified scrum master by my favorite scrum master. You. Wow. Um, by scrum Inc. He's a two-time scrum master. He's twice the scrum charm. <laughs> <laughs> so th this group of six to nine people, six is good, uh, get together and they on a, maybe it's once a week. Used to be for an hour. Nobody has an hour anymore, so now it's 30 minutes. They'll get together and they'll agree to read in advance uh, one chapter of a book or uh, a few videos or in, in uh, we've developed some, some study action team guides that combine a chapter of a book and videos using a uh, two second lean or that other one you were holding up that isn't the one we just held up. And, and uh, this book right here. Yeah, that one. Uh, combine the, the, uh, the chapter and the videos together because some people don't read, you know. Right. And that's, that's been the thing that's been off putting for study action teams for a lot of people is I don't, I'm sorry, I don't read. Uh, I do, but I'm talking about somebody else. And right. and so they're able to do both of this. And then after they pull out what their big points were in what they've read, they go right into the action piece uh, of how can we put this lesson into action right now on this team, on our project? Right. What can we do with this information? Uh, and, and so that's, uh, and because it's a discussion, now you've got some reinforcing going on. What do you got? Yeah. I wanted to show a book that uh, I called Dan Fauché some years ago. And I said, Dan, I want to learn about problem solving. And I'm tired of not knowing how to do it well. <laughs> and Dan recommended this book to me, Managing oh, to Learn. Shook. Managing yeah, to Learn. Managing to Learn. And this book has been incredible. It has launched. I just, uh, I've got two study action teams going with this now. And I've had just countless executives going yep. through this with us at our company and we'd lead sessions and we, we partnered in 2008, 
2018 with the Lean Enterprise Institute and LCI Lean Construction Institute did a joint training in oh, Virginia. Nice. Yeah. And I got to, that's where I met Kristen Hill for the first time in person after oh, reading right. so many of her posts. Right. And it was on that book. That book brought us together to action. That book came out in, I think, 2008. At least that's when Greg Howell found out about it and said, I Let just found your... this amazing book on A3s and, and the whole yes. process. And, and he said, you, you know, and so Dick Beyer and I, Dick and I were partners at the time on this project, uh, co-facilitators at the time. And we did a study action team with Emily, uh, you know, Greg's daughter, who was working for us also. Uh, so the three of us did a study action team on managing to learn. And it, it is such a, one of the cool things about this. And I, I have no idea how to write a book like that uh, because he wrote it. Uh, there are parallel parts of the page, right? And right. one is the the thoughts and role of the champion, the, the A3 yeah. champion, and the other is the thoughts and role of the mentor. And you can read one and then go to the other. And it, it's just so... Uh, uh, yeah, I'll show an example. So you see like there's black yeah, ink and, and blue ink. Yeah, yeah. And the, the black and, and ink is the, the hero and the blue and the, the blue ink is the boss, yeah. the mentor. Mendor. What a beautiful way of writing a book from two different perspectives. Hollywood does it sometimes with different cut cuts of movies and things, but I've never seen a book written that way. So it's cool. Yeah. It's but, the only one that I've ever seen too. And, and I found out I had a guest on my show in season one, Katie Anderson. She wrote a book about uh, learning to lead, leading to learn. Isio Yoshino. And he is actually the Ken Sanderson character in managing to learn. Oh my. He was, he was Ken Sanderson. And I, I got to meet him, and it was like such a, a cool thing to meet somebody, a character, based you've on the book. Reading. <laughs> yeah. And now and the next time I meet Stan Chu again, because he was also on the show, I get to meet somebody who was a cartoon and now is a person yes. again. <laughs> yes. Cartoon Stan is a really good cartoon. It's a, it's a cool cartoon. I got to see this. What is, uh, what is Go See Lean Operations? Like, how, why are so many people keep talking about this? I hear people inside of some large healthcare companies and they use this go see vernacular all the time. Yeah. What are they talking about, Dan? Just back to Gemba for the most part. It means uh, don't just think about the problem in the abstract or think about the opportunity or the process or whatever. Go see what's actually happening. In in A3, it's, it's you got to do the go see. Uh, if you really want to diagnose what the, the current state is, uh, mm -hmm. go see what the people are actually doing, how they're actually do processing this information or, or where the problem is or whatever it may be. And, and immediately, uh, I mean, one of the big things about problem solving is that you can't wait, uh, no. because you, you need to swarm it, uh, which is the way Alcoa used to talk about it. And I, and Steve Spear, uh, talks about swarm the problem, uh, because the people's memories need to be fresh. Their observations need to be fresh. Memories fade. Witness right. statements change. <laughs> yeah. You know, in, in any detective story uh, over a period of time, if if you don't look at it right then, that's why when there's a crime scene, they immediately begin interviewing the witnesses because their memories are fresh and, uh, and, and they'll change. The go see means right then, uh, see what's, what's happening, talk to the people who are doing it, uh, and don't just imagine what it is or, or go from your own observations. There's a big movement now uh, about uh, Toyota Kata that was made popular by Mike Rother, who wrote in a book with John Shook as well called Learning to See Value Stream Mapping, which is a book yeah. I'm sure you've read, Dan. I'm sure you've read it. Good stuff. <laughs> It is good stuff. You know, for people listening, like, why should I, why should I write down stuff to do problem solving? And A3 problem solving is for complex problems that involve more than yourself. So it's not for everything. You don't A3 everything. No, it's really great for, for collaboration on problem solving. It's great for decision making. Way back at that other IPD project in 2008 with, with uh, uh, Greg and others, um, the, the design team did a, all the cluster groups did a series of A3s on each of the options that they were looking at. They had analyzed them and then, and then they would summarize their study in the A3 and, and then pack them together and put an A3 on top of it and, t t you know, and summarize what they were recommending that be used. It's wonderful to see a wall of A3s 
uh, because all the information in the world that you could want to know about that particular thing is right there. Right there. I've even started seeing some people use A3s to uh, formulate RFIs on complex mm. uh, mechanical issues recently in design. I've, I've got a handful that I've seen really inside smart. of our company. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, I haven't heard that. Even one of the mechanical specialists that we have had said that they were going down a path in the A3 that they knew the owner didn't want. And wow. when they went through the A3 process and collaborated and everyone was heard because they, yeah. you know, they, yeah. they didn't offer up a single solution. They offered up a series of countermeasures. Right. The owner who was the most reluctant to pick the option that everyone thought was the obvious saw the light and said, it's clear and you guys have done the research and you're not married to any one of the solutions. Go ahead and... Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we received a change order. Yeah, mm. yeah. and it was for so. it was yeah. for added services, so it's okay. Well, and you know what? That's that's taking the set based design approach to an RFI, yeah. which is really really smart. Uh, identify the sets. What are the choices for the for the mitigation measure? Right, uh, right. which is kind of like the same thing. So it okay. is, and, and sometimes some of those advanced things, Dan. You know, you do have to just hire a coach or. Bring somebody in that has some good expertise. Uh, I know a company that benefits by having an internal coach quite a bit, but for you know other organizations that have to hi hire some outside help, what kind yeah. of return do people get for coaching that they use? At least in the larger, more complex realm of design and construction that doesn't use coaching annually. What uh, yeah. what is the pool for coaching in so many different companies? There? What are you seeing, Dan? I just ran across a, a study literally a few days ago. Uh, that was talking about, and it, this this was a study, I think it was a Harvard study, of executive coaching, that the ROI was 5.7 to 1. Five times the benefit uh, compared to the cost. Uh, coaching accelerates learning, um, but if it's really good coaching, it right. really <laughs> accelerates learning because really good coaches care about the people. They don't just go in and they're not just a sage on a stage, yeah. you know, talking about stuff. They don't, that's not coaching. That's saging. Um, <laughs> you know, that's being uh, a, a they, prophet. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. Something like Old that. Testament. Yeah. Um, and, but a, a really good coach really understands the person. Uh, maybe you're going through something today. You know, this may, something may have happened on your way to work or before you left for work or what, or whatever and and just presuming that you're the robotic mentee here yeah. is not a is it, that's not coaching uh that's that's kind of cold and impersonal right. so really good coaches get to know the people and, and understand them there's a great deal of emotional intelligence uh involved in that uh and they're vulnerable they, again i go back to greg howell Greg Howell was a really great coach because he was so darn vulnerable. Yeah. The uh, first time I met Greg Howell, and I've, I've written this in, in one of my remembrance, remembrances of him. First time I met Greg uh, in Sacramento, he was in a, in a classroom with about 10 of us, and he was describing for the small group what lean was really like. And it was like our first entree to it. And he was kind of doing it off the top of his head, which is how Greg worked. And... Uh, and so he, he got to a particular point and he just stopped and then he sat down and then he did this. I don't know if you know, you know, Greg would run his fingers through his hair and he said, I'm going to declare a breakdown. I have no idea where to go from here. <laughs> I have no idea what to tell you next. And it was a, a transformational moment for me because I had never seen, and I would never do that at that point. <laughs> You know, I would fake it, man. I would change the topic or something. I had never seen someone just say, you know what? I'm screwed. I have no idea what to say next. It was so vulnerable, so real. Um, and Will Lichting was sitting right there. And Will yeah. said, well, why don't we do this? And and so he got it. And so he was back up at the at the board and he was off and running. But uh, that's that kind of vulnerability, that kind of re realness of, as a human being. Uh, is really what makes a good coach. I think there's something to that on the ROI for sure. We've seen yeah. uh, quite a few companies and there's quite, a, I mean, I don't want to name any consultants names, but there's some big famous household name consultant companies that, that talk about those types of returns. And yeah. if anybody is, I mean, really what you're looking for is it's mentorship. You're getting mentorship yeah. and mentorship always pays off. It does. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and there are plenty of other studies. I just didn't come armed with them. I just happened to have been reading that one. But the whole idea of 
of a connection with someone. It, it, there, there are some people I can't coach because I can't connect with them. You know, yeah. not too many because uh, I'm, I'm pretty open. I know but, what you mean. Uh, you know, yeah. they, I mean, they're so, just, they're not available. Yeah, they just, they won't open up. You yeah. can feel them at a, at a distance, like you approach and you can yeah. feel them turning away from you. Yeah. Yeah, I know exactly well, what you're talking you about. Can, sometimes you can see it in, a, in someone's body. Uh, uh, you know, the, the pain of being a human being uh, ends up getting stored in the muscles that we use. So if, we're, if you're someone who works outdoors a lot and, you know, tradesmen or something, the, it would be stored in the big muscles of your leg or your arms or something. And if you're someone who works in an office, it's stored in your face uh, or, or in your back. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw I saw a, uh, a, a design consultant one time, early 30s, sweet woman, bless her heart. She was literally hunched over and it wasn't from, uh, you know, physical deformity. It was because her muscles were so had storing so much pain that, uh, yeah. it, you know, she was she could barely move. She was almost immobile uh, in terms of being able to walk, you know, casually and calmly. Um, and, and so you're looking for, when you, when you're working with someone, you're looking for evidences of, uh, you know, that there are other things going on that maybe, uh, we should end up talking about. This isn't psychological counseling. This yeah. is just two human beings right. being human beings. When I first got into this type of role, Dan, I had quite a few people break down just when you, yeah. you're making that connection and you're just talking about what yeah. we want to do with lean, like, uh, like you said in the book. You know, it's about giving the customer what they want at the right amount, just at the moment they want it. And, you know, that simple concept about why is respect for people one of the pillars of the Toyota production system? And the person and I were just having a casual conversation about just those principles because they were commenting on, like, you're fanatical about the principles. And I was like, yeah, they enable <laughs> they enable everything to happen. Like, yeah. I could tell you, give you a checklist and say, do this, then do this, then do this. But you might not ever get it to work with another person because you don't have that first part. And the person just suddenly like just burst into tears. And we were like in a very public place. And I yeah. said, I just said, come here. And we just, uh, yeah. you know, had a, had a moment. And, and then when it was over, they said, I can't believe I did that. And I said, happens all the time. I was like, yeah. if you ever go to the yeah. movies with me, you'll just see me break, <laughs> break down. <laughs> <laughs> you'll have you'll have to hold my head yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> I, remember I, took my, I took my son dan to see uh disney or pixar's inside out and he would come out oh. of the theater and he's like that's the last time i'm going to the movies with you dad <laughs> <laughs> but it's okay Is he at the stage where, where he wants to shake hands now you know he'll still hold my hand when we walk outside okay. across right. the street every now and then i have to All like right. snatch it like kind of quick yeah but it's yeah. okay He's a yeah. good, he's a good kid. We all go through that. Yeah. But I think, uh, you know, a lot of people in our industry, and I don't know if this is true about our industry. I've only worked here and just dabbled a little bit in manufacturing. People think sometimes we're just not allowed to be emotional, Dan. I know. I, I don't, I don't get it. I mean, I, I guess I do get it because back in the day, in my project manager yeah. day, um, that, you know, you, you wanted to come off professional, but I think I've always kind of been just a, guy you know human being um and and i've understood that you know i in my uh my very first career i was a minister did i ever tell you that? no you never told me that i don't talk about it much um uh, forensic <laughs> consultant had, minister I've man had, this is not on your linkedin I, profile dan i, I would know it isn't uh, it's not gonna be uh <laughs> i was in the restaurant business once upon a time anyway <laughs> i've had many careers i was i was in prison okay Bum, bum, bum. As a counselor. <laughs> and a, I was and waiting to hear your crime. I was, I was waiting. For I that. said to someone in the scrum cast class a couple of weeks ago, yeah. I said to someone, uh, so, so when I was in prison, my nickname was Dance and Dan because I was, I don't know, we're doing this stuff. And, uh, and she, you know, one of the, they, were, they were just kind of, yeah. it's kind of fun just to watch, just, just to drop that little yeah. bump. And then as a counselor and an administrator, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But uh, no, as a, I was a, I was a minister, so I, I kind of started out uh, as the one who listens, uh, apparently the one who talks a lot too. Um, but uh, confirmed. 
but uh, but as as one who listens and, and one who cares and you know and with a lot of feeling there so maybe that kind of teed me up for for that for you i don't know you just come by it honestly yeah i just uh it's a it's just the upbringing i had that yeah created that it's it's tough for people to make those connections especially where we're into this let's categorize everything like personality yeah. types and strengths finders yeah. and introverts versus extroverts you know red yeah. versus blue all these different things but you know what what's interesting about extroverts and introverts in construction aside the fact that almost 99 percent of superintendents are introverts that yeah I, I i think that being introverted is the great secrets the big secret in construction um and i say this as i'm confessing i'm an introvert um i have i learned at a very young age very young age uh that i needed to appear to be extroverted uh in order to survive wow. uh that was my defense was was to be glib and and you know and that sort of thing and my mom when i was five years old gave took me to a a, a lady down the, the road we were in the farm country and she gave expression lessons they called it uh so they teach you to get up on stage and do a reciting recite a thing or whatever so i i gained confidence there but but i learned that you can you can keep you can stay safe inside your introversion <laughs> oh. by by being extroverted uh but then you have to be careful not to like never feel anything you know mm -hmm. uh, and or really never connect but yeah we we did a uh, a study action team with several other coaches um and in most of them internal coaches to companies uh a couple of years ago people that you actually know mm -hmm. um and we we did we read a book about introverts and extroverts uh, as, as one of our the books we were reading and uh we, we all thought we were confessing a secret that we were introverts and everyone in the group was an introvert wow um and everyone said to each other i can't believe that you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah like uh most of the heads of businesses are introverts yeah, it's uh, and I'm a extrovert with the capital E, Dan. So disclaimer, it is oh, all right. extreme extroversion, is where I'm almost <laughs> off the scale. It's it's oh wow yeah, it's like I I tell people all the time like it's it's to the point where I don't know what I'm thinking until I say it out loud to another human being, and then oh, I find out what yeah. I'm thinking at the same time you do. Yeah, and uh, well, I've had uh, I've had some int introverts send me literature that says that extroversion is a abnormality and it's a mutation <laughs> so. well, based on the statistics you just gave me that would appear to be potentially true yeah so <laughs> i don't know the validity of those studies dan because no, as an I, extrovert I, they didn't say it aloud to me so i just threw those away <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my daughter's a psychologist i think she would disagree that that it's uh something abnormal I, I, she, that there are introverts and extroverts i have two grandkids twins boy and a girl and and one of them's an introvert and one's an extrovert mm -hmm. and the extrovert acts like an introvert and the introvert acts like an extrovert <laughs> <laughs> so i have no idea what's going on no that sounds right <laughs> so you know since we just admitted that uh, we don't know everything dan let's talk about something else that a lot of people don't know why don't more people embrace lean from your perspective? Oh man, Joe, Joe had some great ideas about why people don't embrace lean. And I like his ideas a lot better. So just insert his clip okay, in there. We'll just, we'll, but, yeah, we'll put a link to the oh, clip that Dan's talking about, Joe Damaruno on the podcast, talking about how to convince a skeptic or how he deals with yes. skeptics about embracing lean. I mean, it was brilliant. First of all, I think uh, <clears throat> inertia, in in the universe is a powerful force yes and lean requires that you not be inert it requires that you do something it requires that you become more that you improve that you you know and and inertia is a powerful force so if you're not someone who, who if you just want to sit you're probably not going to do much in the world of lean um the other part of it and for this from the superintendent's perspective is uh, a lot of superintendents, and I used to be this guy uh, when I was a manager, were are, are firefighters. You know, it's exhilarating to be a firefighter. Uh, it's addictive. 
and it's rewarded. If you can parachute in behind enemy lines and fight a fire and put it out, you will be celebrated with floats and parades. Promotion uh, is in your future soon. Yeah. Uh, also, some, some human beings kind of like contractual conflict. Uh, they, they, you know, uh, and I'm, I'm sorry to say that a lot of my friends who are construction managers are in this camp. Uh, you know, people who hire themselves as the agent for the owner. Uh, they pound the contract, they look to the contract, and some people take it to the next level. Mm -hmm. Now, some contractors do that too. Right. Uh, none of the people you and I know, and none of the people you and I have ever worked for except one, in my case. Um, <laughs> and if I tell you that company and that person's name, you would, you would recognize it immediately and say, yep, that's right. Yep. Uh, but they will look at conflict as the moneymaker. Uh, you know, it's the old, uh, the, the big, the big uh, ship, the big yacht mm -hmm. is, is called, uh, the, little, the little dinghy behind the big yacht is called the contract. The big yacht is called change order. Yeah. Uh, and, and there are companies that, that kind of do that. So that kind of conflict, uh, I, I knew, I knew a, actually knew a company when I was uh, in, in claims that was, I was working for the owner at the time and their contractor literally waged war and their initials of the company were w a r uh, and it was it was a person's name wow. but that was that was what it spelled and they lived up to it um incredible but waste can be profitable that's the other part of it when we start talking about eliminating waste if you've got a contract that pays you based on the number of people you have to assemble in order to execute the contract why not waste more why not be a clerk of the works and and waste a whole bot, bunch of you know of the owner's money, uh, and just keep track of it and tell them look how bad these people are being. Yeah. So uh, I don't know. No, there's, I, there's a lot. I of know reasons. a general contractor that uh, does a lot of work in one of the western states, and when you sign, when once you sign the the contract, the owner signs a the contract, they get a letter instantly from their lawyer, and they start. The lawyer just finds all the problems in the contract, and they start nickel and diamond yeah. the, the client even before they do anything. Yeah, and they're still in business uh, uh, today, making a good living. Making a very good living, yeah. Flying jets, yeah. No, yeah. I, I, it's a, it's a dirty side of the business. Uh, I couldn't handle being a claims consultant for very long uh, because it just it just didn't feel right. I could just see all these silly fights over that could have been prevented on a particular day by just talking about it. Right. Uh, so, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, so I think that's another reason that, that some people will not do, uh, the right thing, uh, you know, not, not do lean will not reduce waste because they get paid for it. Uh, they're making money on it and, and that's too bad, but sooner or later that will change too. It's changing slowly you know, now. Well, it is. And the interesting thing to me, uh, which, by the way, was also part of the reason we organized a Gang of 16, was that when we, I, I did a calculation on LCI's membership, uh, all of the uh, contractors and trade contractors uh, and, and architects. When, when you, if you list all of them, I, I have the list and, and uh, you do too, but I'm yeah. and the rest of this in an Excel spreadsheet and put their 2019 gross volume in the U.S., Separately, separate column in, in internationally, and then forget about that column because we're just talking U.S. And, and then employee count, and then in the last cell, the source for your information, which for the big ones is ENR, right? Right. Um, if, you, if you do that work, you will find out that 29% of the gross dollar volume in the U.S. of non-single family housing of everything else is done by LCI contractors. Oh, wow. 29%. So if the people who already know about this already represent 29% of the marketplace, non-single family marketplace, why isn't 29% of all the projects, why aren't they lean? And the answer is because it hasn't been pulled deeply in through all the organizations. And, and so what do we need to do? And that was the question that we posed. The other question we posed to the gang of 16 was what do we do to pull lean deeply into our organizations so we can hit that 20? Because that's the tipping point. That's, in fact, it's before that. But, you know, if you, if you read the book, The Tipping Point, if you can get it like if you're there, yeah. 
then that's where the industry is going. And it will be there. It's just taking longer than we thought. Well, even in that 29%, Dan, you have to get saturation inside each of those member organizations. Yeah. And since you and I both know the world is fractal, in those yeah. any one of those companies, you don't have 100% saturation. You get a couple of the more that's influential it. ones, and you get a couple of yeah. the clients. A yeah. couple, so clients that are listening out there, you can accelerate this and get more yeah. bang for your buck. And have a, a greater experience for all people involved, us included, coaches yeah. included, like Dan too. Let's let's all uh, let's all have a better time. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You 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 sleep better at night. You you don't work as many hours because you don't work on waste. You work on value, and forty hours is going to do it for you. You don't have to miss your kid's soccer game or baseball game on Saturday because you were at the office or on the job site. Because yeah. you don't have to spend your time wasting your time. Right. I've even heard from, from clients that work for owners that they're having meetings on the weekends as well. They're burning yeah. out. And there's a yeah. lot of big uh, serial clients that are burning out project managers every single day. I mean, that's not respect for people. And there are some companies that expect all of their employees to work 60 hours a week, period. I'll pay you for 40, you work 60. Right. Um, and I, I, that's because we haven't recognized and cleaned up the waste. You don't need to work 60 hours and you're not as good. Uh, I mean, any study plus your own life yeah. will tell you that that's too many hours and, and all the other 40 aren't as good because of the, of the extra 20. <laughs> Yeah, that's called yeah. diminishing returns. Yeah. And that's what happens. Yeah. Now, you want to be, yeah. bring your best self here, just like we did for this podcast. Dan, it has been amazing having you on the show, and I cannot believe how fast the time went by. Land the plane. Let's land the plane, Dan. Dan, you get the last word. I'm genuinely honored to be on your podcast, Felipe. Uh, the, the, it's, ever since I started tuning in, uh, I've, I've been a fan. Uh, I've I, I hope you cut out all the bad, stupid parts. <laughs> those, those are the parts I just put at the I, beginning. <laughs> okay. Try to find something that's gem worthy somewhere in there. Uh, but if you don't, you can just cancel me and say it, it was it was a wonderful time to be with you. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Very special thanks to my guest. I'm Felipe Engineer Manriquez. The EBFC show is created by Felipe and produced by a passion to build easier and better. Thanks for listening. Stay safe, everybody. Let's go build. <laughs>